And by the 1950s, you've got this explosion of television and whole generations growing up. You know, they're not interested in text in the same way because they've got this flood of imagery um, widely distributed everywhere, televisions in every room, moving images, bombarding you. And uh, rather than like responding to that and with this sort of alarm that many people would, that, oh no, kids, you know, they're just all zombied out with television. He was saying there was an unintended positive consequence of this, that whatever they're watching, whatever rubbish they're watching on TV, it rewired their brain. So they flip more into a, a right brain consciousness, more of a lunar, what you call lunar consciousness. Um, that would be closer to a matriarchal culture, so they became... So suddenly you got the 60s hippies, men growing their hair, becoming more feminine against war. And, um, I mean, it's a bit of a cartoon sort of uh, description, but you got definitely got a swing going on um, with that generation that were bombarded with imagery. So he looks at the emergence of the printing press and the effects that had, and Mao's Little Red Book and the Viet, the Viet Cong and the way that... that written language change their ideology. I mean, it, it gets a little bit carried away, but the, the core idea is that alphabets are kind of a, you could say, dangerous technology because they they cause some sort of extreme behaviour in, in the structure of the brain. Um, not the physical structure, but they, they you know, they, in the mind, perhaps. You, know what this, you get this left brain, left brain hemisphere, um, hyperactivity, which leads to social structures being uh, inverted or, or um, seriously mutated and arguably that's not necessarily a good thing um, depends what your value system is I suppose but uh, so he followed that and then most recently a third book was um, I've mentioned this in previous reality reports Ian McGilchrist the master and his emissary you come across that was about maybe six seven years ago that came out Okay, he's an Oxford literary theorist who got interested in neuroscience after he was studying poetry as an Oxford professor and got interested in the mind but then needed to understand more about the brain so he started studying neuroscience and ended up doing a PhD in it um, and now he writes about, well he wrote this wonderful book about brain hemisphere relations informed by his kind of poetic sensibilities as much as his neuroscience background. Similarly he argues there was a kind of flip, he doesn't sort of link it in the same ways as as, um, as Leonard Schlein's The Alphabet versus The Goddess. I don't think he even refers to that book. But McGilchrist, who's quite a serious academic, argues that um, the, the the left brain sort of exists to serve the right brain hemisphere in some way. It's easy to just, the, the right brain has traditionally been the, the master which, unable to oversee the entire sort of kingdom, has to send out emissaries to um, to look after certain aspects of it and occasionally one of those would become corrupted or um, compromised and start to feed false information or whatever distorted information back to the master in order to usurp <laughs> and he believes that's what hap that's what's happened um, a usurpation of power in a sense that we've become left brain centric or our culture has he's got a very subtle understanding of how the hemispheres work compared to the simplistic one that you generally hear about the you know the logical versus the sort of poetic or um, artistic or intuitive, but it's both both hemispheres seem to be able to do everything, but it's more the way they do them. Okay. If you're a bird pecking seeds, the left brain hemisphere is focusing on the individual seeds and getting them and obsessing over, you know, getting them as quickly and accurately as possible. Whereas the right brain hemisphere is, is thinking about what's going on around it, like got an eye out for predators. So you've got these sort of twin processes working, and one's very much focused on detail and doing things correctly. And one's just getting an overall impression, um, and it seems that's what's going on with our hemisphere. I was sort of under the vague impression that maybe um, the left brain, right brain thing has been kind of discredited these days by scientists. Ian, Ian McGilchrist writes a huge preamble to his book, basically, you know, having again, having qualified as a neuroscientist, explaining what happened in that the, there was this kind of popular interest in the early research in the 70s and 80s which led to a load of really s simplistic, superficial and misleading nonsense to be written by people who didn't know what they were talking about okay. which led the neuroscience establishment to sort of back away from the problem and just say we don't really understand it mm. and we, you know, anyone who's claiming to is to just shouldn't be listened to because they're a charlatan. So it kind of became unpopular as an area of research rather than discredited. 
the, the simplistic ideas became discredited. Mm. But clearly we have two, I mean, there are two hemispheres, we know that. We don't fully understand why or how they communicate or, you know, but it seems that on the whole you'll get certain human activities will be associated with the activity on one side rather than the other. But in some cases it could be completely reversed and there seems to be the possibility of learning to certain historical trans transitions, revolutions and new ideas, the Renaissance, the Reformation, um, the Industrial Revolution, those sorts of big social sort of waves that you get culturally, artistically. Um, he, he's arguing that these can be seen as sort of swings of a pendulum between these two hemispheres and the dominance that they, or the, um, you know, the relative dominance that they've achieved at that time. And that we've seemed to have swung to, to some extent to uh, in some sort of extreme position in terms of kind of left brain, uh, left brain dominance seems to be, not, not in everyone, yeah. just in the way that society's structured yeah. and the way, yeah, technology has become, the, sh the shape that it has assumed, you know what I mean? The total yeah. picture, the total shape of everything. Well, the technology that we have that's defined so much of the way society goes about its business is very kind of left brain technology, you know, like mm. the way that you interact with it requires that kind of intelligence. Mm. Um, so it's true. It, it, it's reinforcing that bias. Yeah, and I, I suppose maybe a lot of people don't ever really make much use of the right brain consciousness kind of thing, like intuition and kind of more holistic awareness of things. I mean, I was I was one of those people that didn't, you know, till my adult life, I was I was a very very left brain centric kind well, of person. Yes, yeah, and kind I could of easily how they're raised to be. You know? And uh, but yeah, I was I think I was an I was an outlier, you know, the sort of way my mind worked compared to say my other kids in at school, you know. A severe left brain. Yeah, brain. and uh, luckily I had experiences and met people and had you know connect made connections and internally and externally. Yeah, I'm the same I think. Actually. Moved me away from that. Uh, As a child and a teenager, very like literal and very like obsessed with justice and everything. Mm. You know, like these kinds of things. It's strange, isn't it? Um but um it's interesting that this guy thinks the the alphabet is has been such a major part of moving us from left brain to no from right brain to left brain consciousness because it seems like it makes sense to say that language would do that um what well, just spoken I mean, language yeah. or written language i mean it, it makes sense to say that the alphabet would do it. it makes complete sense but um if you already have a spoken language being able to depict it in letters it feels like it would make less of a of a change to your consciousness than language in itself, which is a very defining mm. thing, you know, like our consciousness is pretty much, you know, like... Well, I think animal communication was uh, one of the topics on this. We're not the only creatures that use language, clearly. No, um, that's and, true. And, uh, but like symbolic language? Symbolic language is something else. I think the emergence of symbolic language was definitely, we crossed a threshold in yeah. the way our consciousness works. I don't know how to characterise that. But I, I do, I am more or less convinced by Schlein and other people, you know, mainly Schlein, but I think you could say that McGilchrist and um, Julian Jane's ideas would be in sympathy with this. The idea that the coming of alphabetic language um, was was the thing that we'd associate with the uh, that flip of rather than the coming of language itself which is much older. I mean until people started using alphabets we can't really have much awareness of what their language was like anyway because obviously using hieroglyphs and these kinds of things mm. you're not going to write everything the same way that you would say it whereas when you have an alphabet you can write exactly what you would say if you were speaking to somebody. That's true, I never really thought about that. So you, you you're expressing something in a there's not really a voice there when you write it with hieroglyphs. Yeah, and maybe like you oh. know prepositions and these kinds of things, uh, like the connecting words, the structure of how like, the thing is. All those words, all those parts of speech which link parts of sentences together. We haven't, yeah. you wouldn't have those in hieroglyphs. You've just got the the objects or the act, acts. 
and the nouns and the verbs. So um, and the adjectives. There's this theory some guy has about uh, why a lot of ancient myths feature talking animals and these kinds of things is because um, before language was so fully developed and you were able to have a word for pretty much anything you wanted to talk about even if it's like an abstract concept and stuff you know you want to talk about like some kind of sneaking evil thing you don't have those words so you talk about it's a snake that comes and tells you to do bad things mm. or something like this um, and so I was thinking about that because of what you were saying about the Odyssey and um, like a lot of ancient literature where people seem to just, you know, they're just doing whatever they feel like doing and, and when there's a crisis God tells them you should go right this God, way. usually, yeah. And, um, and maybe you would think this is just like a poetic way of speaking about it because, you know, like often you might have like a kind of revelatory thought and s describe it as like, oh, you know, God told me I should do this, but you don't really mean you heard God say that to you, you mean like you had a bit of an epiphany. Yeah, some it? people would use it like that, but I mean, that that's the way we use language now and the way that it was used then. Is so, I mean, there's such a distance now that you can't really, one doesn't really back up the other in the sense that it was meant, you can't, do you know what I mean? You yes. I don't think you can assume it was meant in the same way. You might be right. Um, I suppose it's more exciting to believe that they actually did genuinely sort of see yeah. God's appear and tell and it, them things. It it's makes, certainly written like that. It makes quite complete matter of sense fact, as well, like with the, when you think about it, with the left and the right brain not being this cohesive unit. Like with um, schizophrenic people, you know, they think that they're hearing an external voice and maybe they think it's God or, you know, like a dead ancestor or something like this talking to them and actually it's just their own thoughts but if because of this peculiar wiring of their brain it feels like it's something external so you can imagine if your brain is wired slightly differently to how ours are these days the thoughts that you have with your left brain maybe would sound like yeah or um, the right brain I think um, I think James was suggesting but it, what, either way it's like one's talking to the other or there's, there's an unfamiliar there's an un non-recognition of the voice as oneself but I think it must be the left brain that is when God speaks to you know, because you're just you're chilling in your right brain mm. consciousness just yeah. following your intuition and then you have like oh, yeah. a real uh, dilemma that you have to think about so then your left brain comes into play and like analyzes it out and gives it to you and this maybe but then if you think about like say um the great scientific discoveries that when you when mathematicians and physicists report the moment that they got this amazing idea this breakthrough mm. idea that's after months and years of applying themselves with the, the most left brain of all activities, you know, writing mm. out equations and evolving mathematical models. And then they get stuck and then suddenly this idea just kind of flashes through them yeah. in a way that they can't explain it. So it would get it would appear that those sorts of ideas come from the right. But maybe the which is which isn't so important as the fact yeah. that it's about one talking to the other. It's just, you know, you're in one state of consciousness, so whichever one is the one that you don't ordinarily use when it communicates something to you, it mm. feels like... Um, this kind of uh, outside know. voice yeah yeah and he was claiming i mean james was claiming that the two basically the wall broke down between them so rather than being a two-chambered mind we became a single chambered mind and that was when the modern sense of self came about where you have this i'm me kind of experience so sitting inside your head kind of looking out and that's how a lot of people think of themselves um and that that's quite a recent thing he would argue